so by some kind of Halloween miracle, after over a week of being completely sick and unable to talk, I got my voice back tonight. And as such, greetings, dear friends. Given that it is October, my favorite month of the year in which we celebrate one of my favorite things in the world, horror, I feel I should take some time to describe some of the psychology behind that oh-so-beloved genre of mine. While I have been giving public presentations on Asian horror in particular for oof, seven years or so now, I can't very well just get up on here on YouTube and show you all clips from movies that I like without getting shut the fuck down. So instead, I want to describe my second favorite thing regarding horror beyond the actual act of reading, watching, or generally consuming it, and that is how we interact with horror mentally and why we as humans like horror, because frankly, it's a bit of a conundrum. The basic premise there is quite simple. There doesn't seem to be any real reason that is overtly obvious as to why humans would enjoy being frightened, right? I mean, generally speaking, people want to feel good, not terrified, for fear is a negatively valenced emotion. I saw an interesting comment from a viewer on a recent video that was critical of my use of the terminology, quote, negatively valenced emotion. And I think, um, at least in part, I need to explain that, I really do. And that that particular criticism should help to explain both how the term is used in social science and what my meaning is behind my use of the term. Uh, to say something is negative in our emotional schema does not necessarily mean it's bad. However, it does mean that it's typically associated with a type of affective distress. Terror is certainly therefore one of the most, if not the most, negatively valenced of emotions. Given the most basic animalistic responses we experience really is the fight, flight, freeze, fear response to a stimuli. This is so basic that almost all of it functions on a subconscious level Level, and so automatically that it is essentially impossible to combat our intrinsic heuristic response to a fear-inducing stimulus with any level of logic or reason. While we certainly can process our fear at a later point through cognitive processing, the immediate response to something we perceive as even potentially dangerous is in and of itself entirely autonomic. Why do we jump at a winding, twisting stick in the grass? Well, simply because of our genetic cognitive heuristics, a series of mental shortcuts that are activated immediately by the hypothalamus in the amygdala that are looking to assess threats to our well-being. While the amygdala is associated with emotional memory and processing, the hypothalamus is associated with instantaneous memory processing in the response to a threat. And as such, well, when you see that stick in the ground, the way that your brain processes it and analyzes it is that stick may very well be a snake. And in response, we shit our pants and react in either a fight, flight, or freeze response, either stomping on it in fight, running away like a little baby girl, or perhaps just laying down and playing dead like a pussy bitch, essentially. This is a distressing situation. And when the hypothalamus is activated in this state, part of the temporary processing I mean, is is limited in the communication to the left brain, the rational thought center and long-term storage of information and logical memories database. The evolutionary purpose for this is so that action can be taken as expediently as possible without overloading our minds with excess, well, thoughts. As I've explained before, the human brain, while magnificent, takes up an incredible amount of energy. And to overload our brains with tons of information to think, hmm, what should I do in response to this snake in the grass? Well, there's no real reason for that when we can have a cognitive heuristic to activate the hypothalamus just like that, and then to only process on our right side of the brain without bothering in the left-hand side with all of its conflicting and complex logical and rational thought processes. Fucking stupid brain thinking too much. A clear example of the kind of negative, however, long-term effect of temporary left and right brain communication severance is evident in the instances of post-traumatic stress disorder, however. PTSD is believed by some psychologists to be a result of this particular disconnect between the right and left brain that is activated during instances of extreme emotional stress or fear. The result, given this disconnect, is that the long-term memory center, again the left-hand side of the brain, is not able to properly catalog and file information received in an instance of severe emotional distress. As such, when related data are recalled in the future, the memories are often fragmented or misunderstood when trying to be assessed by both the left and right side of the brain in their meaning or significance. This means that the brain as an entire system is then ill-equipped to assess information about a previously experienced fear response and as a result may then apply a similar fear response inappropriately. 
For example, why may a veteran perhaps mistake the sound of fireworks for enemy fire and become highly alert again, and this is the really sad part, activating the fight-flight-fear reaction in the hypothalamus in a horrible cycle that once again closes communication in the long-term memory processing center between the left and right side of the human mind. Whoa, Aiden, what the fuck? Why are you talking about brains? Uh, well, here's the freaking point. It's all actually kind of simple, my point in mentioning all of this. Why then, knowing that fear and terror can have such a horrible negative outcome on our cognition, on the entire structure of our fucking brains long term, why then would humans knowingly subject themselves to horror, to fear, to activate the hypothalamus fight, flight, freeze response mechanism, let alone happily pay to be afraid? This seems like a complete and utter absurdity, a true conundrum, right? Well, maybe not so much as you might immediately think, and in the first part of this series, I will attempt to describe these states. It is the temporary rationales that we may have for introducing our brains and our bodies to a thing that we have every rational reason to avoid. Horror, fear, and spooky scary skeletons. What's good, Nuka? Been a long time coming, but it finally came for Bun B to get his motherfucking shot in the game. Before we begin, very quickly, I do want to describe the differences between states and traits, since this video will be focusing on states in particular. A state is temporary, and a product of any number of factors or variables that affect the mind be it the time of day, your level of hunger, your level of tiredness, or really any other number of the myriad of reasons that we arrive at any point of time in our existence that are non-permanent. In contrast, a trait is longitudinal and lasts over a period of multiple assessment. This first video will assess what states may motivate us to seek out what is intentionally designed to disturb and terrify us. Why, based on our states, we would seek out horror and horror media. So prepare to doot your ass off and welcome to Aiden's Wild Ride. Disclaimer, there is no getting off Aiden's Wild Ride. Except, of course, through the exit carousel. <laughs> anyway, let's describe some of the history of the research on horror. Really, when it comes to the scary, and interestingly enough, to the pornographic, and stick through this entire series for that explanation, because, uh, there is a pretty much direct correlation. You gotta start with Dr. Joel Silman. Wow, a native German who was really into researching both terror and porn. <laughs> Imagine my shock. Anyway, Dr. Zillman in many ways is the father of modern media effects research and media psychology research. Early initial proposals in understanding the media and why we use media and for what purpose we use it is the hedonic principle. That we use media in order to feel good and to improve our mood state. We're always seeking to maximize our good feelings. And that would make sense from a sort of outside standpoint, but hang on, hang on a second. That clearly was very quickly countered by the fact of the extance of things like tearjerker film, dramas, and horror. So while there is still use of the hedonic principle in that it is not so much to feel good but to feel well <laughs> aroused, the research could obviously not cease there with the idea of hedonism. Zillman then proposed the idea of excitation transfer theory based primarily on Hull's drive theory of behavior, that is that a drive or a stimulus can be extended to an unrelated object or pattern of behavior, and Schrockter's two-factor theory of emotion, in that emotion is based both on stimulus and on interpretation of that stimulus or that emotion based on the environment, seeking more information to inform the rationale behind the emotional response. As a synthesis of that extant research at the time, Zillman's excitation transfer transfer theory posited that, based on the fact that all media pretty much requires conflict, and that conflict is inherently at odds with the hedonic principle of merely feeling good, that media should be enjoyable. That therefore the traumatic or suspenseful portions of media are actually a necessity, in that they allow for the transference of excitement and tension that they themselves produce, these negative portions produce, to result in a greater pleasure through a positive outcome of the media narrative. Okay, Aiden, what the fuck did you just say? <laughs> Hang on. That is, look, all media pretty much tends to follow a general script or structure. At least all media that's really enjoyable outside of, I don't know, children's books or maybe absurd works of random genius like The Room? 
based on your academic or instructional background, whether you want to refer to this structure as the hero's journey or as narrative structure, every story pretty much involves a protagonist suffering some sort of peril that he or she must overcome. This typically happens in the second act or near the center of the heroic cycle. Now, if pure hedonic pleasure, not arousal, which is a different thing, or certainly a related one, was the only reason that we use media, this ancient structure and method method of tale telling would be nonsensical for the perilous period forwards negatively balanced emotions inherently. It forwards emotions of fear, of sadness, of concern for the welfare of our heroes. However, a story without any conflict is frankly fucking boring. All tales, at least any worth listening or paying attention to, require conflict inherently. Zillman then explained this intentional need we seemingly have for unpleasant narrative elements with excitation transfer. That this period of turmoil is used as a method of maximizing ultimately our positive emotions and our emotional experience during the conclusion of the narrative, wherein our heroes, our protagonists, are ultimately successful. That is, the experience of stressful emotions increases our general arousal, our emotional excitement, and then that arousal is transformed into a greater positively balanced emotion at the denouement of the entire narrative when the hero succeeds. But that would not have been transferred, and the emotions would not be so great and extensive if we did not have the period of turmoil at which point we care and fear for the well-being of our protagonist. Therefore, why do people watch horror films that involve a large portion of cinematic runtime being concerned with negatively valenced emotional scenes of fright or terror, of you feeling your chest beating in your rib cage and fearing for the well-being of the protagonist? Well, because the ramping up of the emotions pay out with a happy ending that allows for mitigation not only of the negative feelings, but also with an even greater experience of positive emotions that will carry outside of the theater resulting from the induction of these stressful moments. Of course, I also need to say this, that when people have tried to apply excitation transfer theory to, say, research on aggression, it's not great. It does show, as pretty much all research shows, that when you're aroused, you're more likely to be aggressive, but it doesn't have long-term influences on behavior. This is a whole problem with excitation transfer. What I'm really describing here is why would anyone watch anything that makes them feel bad? When people use excitation transfer in order to say that, hey, I'm going to take my emotions that I felt during playing this video game or while watching this movie, and then I'm going to take out my aggression on someone else, that's true. There is a short-term scaffolding effect, generally speaking, of aggression, not of violence, but of aggression, and it is short-lived. As with all things in media effects, these tend to be short-term, they tend to be small effect sizes. But that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about here today is why the fresh fuck would anyone intentionally subject themselves to something that scares them. But when looking with excitation transfer, another question with this line of reasoning quickly becomes obvious. Specifically that Many horror movies do not have happy endings. In fact, many movies in general do not have happy endings, yet we still watch them. We still play sad games, we still read sad books, or scary books, or upsetting books, or anything. We intentionally still subject ourselves to media that is not happy and doesn't have a happy conclusion. First, though, I would argue, as would many other media effects researchers, and below I will be citing several books and book chapters that I highly suggest checking out rather than any specific studies, although I will also, of course, always be citing specific studies, but less this time maybe than others, given the breadth and depth of this particular area of research, which is my jam, guys, I don't know if you understand at this point, but this is shit I didn't really have to research that much because I love this stuff and know it kind of like the back of my hand. But that is that the mere survival of the protagonist is in of itself potentially a positive transference of emotion through the tumultuous state. Just knowing our hero survived is potentially positive and therefore transfers the 
immense affective tension into a sense of relief and thereby happiness or positive affect. How we relate to our protagonist or protagonists, though, is further elaborated upon in another theory of Dr. Zillman's, which is the three-factor theory of empathy. The three factors of empathy in terms of how we relate to characters, and we've already discussed this many times in PSIs and PSRs, I'll go into that in a second, are innate or reflective, acquired or learned, or deliberate. Innate factors are immediate emotional responses. For example, closing one's eyes when we see someone being physically harmed or gasping. These kinds of things that happen far before our cognitive minds can even begin to process the complexities of the events occurring on screen or in a book or whatever. On screen is generally stronger because we are looking at something that our brains are really not evolutionarily designed to differentiate from reality, but alas. This, however, this innate response is physical purely physical. It is an emotionally sympathetic response to seeing harm occurring to another member of the human species. As with all things in this model, which again did not at the time really include the initial proposal of, for example, parasocial relationships and what relationship <laughs> parasocial relationships have to do with how we react to these interactions in that a character that we like more may be more likely to evoke any of these empathetic responses. But anyway, this initial, this innate response we really can't turn that off. It is one second. You respond by seeing something that affects you because you are looking at another member of the human species, at another human being harmed or affected in some way. The second, which is the acquired empathetic response, while similarly physiological in that, again, it's based on the body, not on the psyche, it just generally increases our arousal. It gains our attention based on our learned understanding of the value of, for example, a human life, or of social norms. Yet again, this too is subconscious. Finally, the receiver, you watching the film, enters into the deliberative stage of empathetic processing, in which either he or she takes the role of the character and empathizes, or potentially quite to the contrary, may produce a positive affect upon witnessing the pain of a dislike other when the information begins to be analyzed by the conscious brain. That means yes, very much, Watching a bad guy get brutally murdered or harmed may actually induce positive affect that is happy feelings, as much as watching our heroes get injured would induce negative sad or afraid feelings within the potential for excitation transference, based on our emotional processing of empathy. But even then, well, that doesn't explain why people would want to watch horror films wherein the entire cast dies and gets gutted, or watch a tearjerker without a positive conclusion. Hey, aside real quick, you know what my favorite drama films of all time are? <laughs> I think I've said this before, but here they are. My favorite dramas are, number one, without question or comparison, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, a melancholic ending message about the inability to let go, and how involvement in a series of destructive relationships is perpetual, even in the face of all knowledge of the futility of said relationships, and second, or number two, 500 Days of Summer, which has, oh, wow, actually pretty much the exact same message and ending, except, at least personally, I find more depressing, because because it is portrayed as a happy conclusion rather than a melancholic one, and third is, well, truly, yeah, the worst. The Fountain, a film with kind of also the same essential message about our inability to let go and move on with our pointless, meaningless human existence, except this time, it stars Hugh fucking Jackman. No, Carla, men don't love that. It turns out we don't love picnics, foreplay, candles, baths, photo albums, or when you drive so that we can relax, and as always, we're not that big on Hugh Jackman. Look at and his struggle to deal with his wife losing her life to cancer. Woo! -hoo! Where is the positive emotional transfer there, Dolph? Same with many horror films, and I love horror films, so we can definitely talk about my love of them, where all the characters die, though. Why then would anyone watch any of this shit? Nothing positive comes out of this. There is no positive excitation transference. It ends on a sad or sour note. Well, another theory from Zillman would offer an alternative explanation in the form of mood management theory. The seminal study of which um, I will describe because for whatever reason, you know, probably some latent mad scientist tendencies in my head really makes me laugh. So, faced with the question of tearjerkers or bad end horror, Dr. Zillman proposed another theory to explain why people might watch these films and conducted an experiment to examine for what case that might be. 
In this 2x2 experimental design, one group of participants were given a battery of stressful stimuli of SAT-type academic tests to complete over the course of, I believe, like two hours? It's been a while. I am citing this off the top of my head, but it will of course be cited below, so fact check me. While the other group of participants were asked to sit around for the same period of time and perform the most mundane task that I presume Dr. Zoman could possibly think of. That was threading washers through a string. Yeah, these kind of things? Just do that for two hours. Afterwards, and this is an important thing for those of you who are unfamiliar of how social science or most research works, but particularly social science, pay attention to this and pay it some mind. Afterwards, after performing these tasks, both groups of individuals were placed within a waiting room and told that the researchers were preparing the second portion of the test and during the interim to relax and watch whatever they preferred to watch on the room's television, with a select number of possible programs available for their entertainment. And here is why I said to pay attention to this, because that was the actual second portion of the experiment. There was no additional second portion of the experiment to assess. It was to assess what type of media the subject chose to watch. And while it may seem a bit skeevy or underhanded to treat participants like this, you have to understand. Many people will try to guess the purpose of your research and in kind respond in a non-naturalistic way. As a result, I'll tell you right now, though perhaps I should not, if you are ever involved in a social science study, the purpose is never what they tell you it is. In fact, in post-tests, occasionally subjects who guess the real purpose of the research may have their data thrown out of the statistical processing because they guessed what it was we were actually assessing and that means it could have affected their processing and their answering of the entire Likert type scale or whatever we were analyzing. <laughs> yeah, I know. Basically, social scientists are always lying to you. And until we publish and then generally we're, we're telling the truth. Hopefully, if I have any integrity for my field. But if you're participating in a study, oh, you're being lied to. Anyway, the point is that the people who spent hours with nail on chalkboard batteries of academic tests, generally, when they were put in this room and told to select their media, selected shit like nature documentaries or calming programs, while the washer threaders, oh, they wanted to watch action and violence, hardcore shit. That is mood management. If you're feeling particularly bored, well then a horror film, regardless of any positive emotional outcome that you may possibly get out of it, may just be the thing to hit the affective spot and maintain or establish a kind of emotional state that you're just looking to achieve. There are certain moods that we may want to achieve or certain moods we may want to maintain. This could also explain, for example, why sad people sometimes want to seek out sad films in an attempt to maintain their own sadness out of some internal desire to do so, to reaffirm their own internal feelings and beliefs, because I want to maintain my sadness. But if I'm really bored, then maybe I want to watch something that's very exciting because I don't like being bored right now. All of this therefore essentially returns to the hedonic principle that we began with, that when we consider hedonic pleasure as a process of arousal, not just of feeling good, in a desired latitude or direction rather than we might otherwise think of as mere pleasure. Arousal can therefore be, in fact, positive, even when it is emotionally negatively valenced. What does that mean? I mean something can be pleasurable because it affects our mood state in a way that is pleasurable, even if it creates a negatively valenced emotional response. When we get into the second part of this series that deals with traits, we will see that through, for example, proneness to boredom, that is one of the things that is associated with liking of horror films. Traits are things that are stable again, and that falls in line with Zillman's mood management theory. We're going to find a lot of support for it. If we're bored, we want to watch something that will induce arousal in order to maintain a mostly positive mood state that otherwise would not be achieved through the consumption of the same media sources under a different environmental set of conditions. Finally, the last state-based reason that I may put forward for watching horror that I want to cover in this part is moral judgment theory, and as a last minor note, because frankly, it's really on the line. That is, most of us really like to see a bully get his or her comeuppance. Again, I'm including this factor hesitantly because there are both state and trait factors that can potentially be involved in how we make moral judgments, in that some people may just simply care more about moral judgments than others. We know that based on our understanding of moral foundations theory. However, generally speaking, I think we all like to see justice get served. <laughs> 
Again, this goes back in part to moral foundations theory and an emphasis on fairness as I described in my last video, but again, that's also why I hesitantly include this aspect in the state side of things, because all people do generally value morality and fairness. It's just the degree to which. And there is research, for example, here was some right here, that suggests that states can affect how we judge things morally. If you have been recently slighted while well, watching a horror movie where in a bunch of horrible, nasty teenagers who you have no reason to root for get systematically murdered may just soothe some of that need for justice vicariously. As a further explanation, again, for why we may actively seek, based on our states and our state-based emotions, choose to engage with horror content and media. Again, you know, how we place moral judgments, this is a little bit up in the air. Everyone makes moral judgments. But if you're feeling particularly slighted and particularly put down, you might just want to feel some little bit of just revenge. And with that, well, frankly, I think I've covered the basics of state-based reasons for using horror media. The second part of this series will, of course, be concerned with the opposite of state's traits. And that may make us more or less drawn to horror. And the final video, should I actually feel it needs its own single piece, I'm not sure yet, will probably deal with empathy and other factors or conclusions regarding to how we as humans utilize horror and for what purpose we utilize it. This will be a series I'm trying to finish by Halloween. I hope that you enjoy it. And if you do, please be sure to like and subscribe. I am Aiden Paladin, Altanavolt. <laughs>